Welcome to the July 28th meeting of the uh, Stockbridge Select Board. Uh, we get started right away. Sorry, we were having some tough technical difficulties, so it took us a few minutes to log in. All right, we're going to start off tonight um, with public comment. Anything that anyone wants to talk about? We see a lot of people on the call, so we're going to try to move it along. Anyone? Uh, can you keep an eye out for hands raised? Log yeah. in right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the question. Yeah, sure. Take the question. Um, what is going on with the? I'm sorry. Can you, you uh, the, the people out there can't hear you unless you come up and speak into the mic. Um, Where's the mic? Mike's right here. You can sit down, introduce yourself. Name and address. I'm going to say something. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Fradley, and I live at 11 Christian Hill Road. Uh, I'm sorry, nine Christian Hill Road. Right. Um, what is going on with the? Uh, Cat and dog fountain. So for the cat and dog fountain, um, the we have an artist, uh, Jeffrey Gulick, who's finishing up the top of it. And then it was determined that the basin itself, the bricks underneath had completely dissolved. So we're actually gonna be taking the entire cement basin up in the fall, replacing it installing a recirculation pump, the rest. We're having a new marble piece pedestal put in uh, by Chester Granite, and then the cat and dog piece will come back. Originally, it wasn't anticipated that we'd have to do the uh, basin, but then um, once we discovered underneath the basin was completely um, dissolved, the bricks actually, if you pushed your fingers into the bricks, they actually right. came right apart. So uh, when's this gonna be completed? Right now, we're hoping to have it completed this fall. And how long has it been out? Um, I'm not, it's, I think it's been a while. Couple Two years. years. Couple years. It's like a long time. Yeah, you know, it was, but the recreation of the actual sculpture has taken about a year alone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. All right. Well, I just noticed that it didn't seem to be progressing, so I thought I'd ask the question. Yeah, no, it's good. It's All right, great. Thank you. And a government page. Hi. Any other questions? Uh, yes, this is Eric Tarlow, uh, 7 Farm Road. Uh, when one crosses the Red Line intersection, there is a noticeable dip as one gets to Pine Street. And if you're not careful, your car bottoms out, which makes crossing a dangerous intersection a little bit more dangerous because you have to be slow. That dip in the pavement has been there for a couple of years. Any plans to take care of that? Uh, I had this is the first I heard. This is the first I've heard about this. Yeah. Well, just drive across that intersection <laughs> and uh, you, you'll see what I mean. It's quite noticeable. All right, well, I'll have the highway department uh, Check that out. Thank you very much. Yep. Other comments or questions? Uh, we have Anita Schwer. Hi, Anita. Hi, Patrick. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you on the select board because um, <clears throat> I wasn't at the uh, July 14th meeting. So I thank you for the appointment to the Cable Advisory Board. I look forward to serving with Michael and the representatives from the other towns. And um, I think the weather tonight shows how important it is to have hybrid meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think I was gonna get on, we lost power, but uh, it did come back. So um, I did wanna thank you. I also wanted to point out that the um, Lieutenant Governor signed an extension of the state legislation uh, requiring hybrid or remote meetings until March, 2023. And as I hope everyone knows, the town at town meeting passed the bylaw requiring um, public meetings to have a remote or hybrid component so that people could participate in real time. And uh, I just think it's so important for us All to right. have Thanks, the Anita. TSB. We got a really long one tonight, but thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. I was wondering um, if someone could comment on where the town stands on accessory dwelling units. Uh, are you, are you close to getting language together? 
We have a, there's, there is an accessory dwelling unit in the bylaw currently uh, that, uh, that uh, there has been some talk about updating. Uh, the scope of the housing production plan that this board funded two meetings ago uh, will, it will include a discussion of what the ADUs are um, and, uh, and, you know, some of the trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, um, being involved with them. Uh, we don't really have a policy other than what's in the current bylaw, currently. Joseph Newberg. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I live at Mackinac Heights, and I just want to call uh, two safety issues to your attention. I'm sure you're sensitive to if you haven't noticed them. Um, there are two large, dead, very dead trees overhanging the road that runs from the town beach to uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one right at the sort of the corner of the town beach, right as you come out of it and turn right and go a little way. And then there's another one a bit further down the road, uh, also on the right side, heading north or south. south. Pardon me? And then uh, heading a little further down the road if you're heading north or south? South towards okay. town. Okay. Uh, um, and I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping you'll, you know, call the tree warden's uh, attention and... Um, urgency to those, as we all know. But thank you for listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, remember, the second home we're going to be starting in a few minutes, but uh, we're going to we're going to be, you know, having a whole session on the second home. Yes, sir. I don't know if anybody else has raised this before, but uh, I'm in Beachwood. And uh, in case of a tree falling over the exit onto the hard road, there's no other way to get out of Beachwood except there is a, a road that could be created via the second exit. Where are we on that? Is that That's a Beachwood issue? issue. I think that's a Beachwood issue, sir. And um, and uh, and for the folks who are here in person, I will ask you to step up when you want to speak. But we're going to start the second homeowner meeting in, in, in just a few minutes. Like we're going to get through a few things on the agenda first, and then um, and then and then go to that. Um, Okay. First of all, we have to take minutes. Did anyone have any changes to the minutes? No, I'll make a motion. You accept the minutes. I had one period. There's one extra period. I'll give it to you after. Um, uh, all those in favor? Do we have a second to the motion. I'll second it. All right. All those in favor? Aye. I'm told I'm not officious enough, so I'm going to try harder. Uh, aye. Uh, all right. Minutes are approved for five for May 12th, 19th, 26th, June 9th, and June 23rd. Fire engine, we need to vote that the maximum useful life of the fire engine to be financed with a portion of the proceeds of the $4 million borrowing authorized by the vote of the town passed May 16, 2022. Article 7 is 20 years. This is a requirement of bound council. I have a motion I'll to- I'll make a motion to accept the 20 years. Second? Yep. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right, look how efficient we are. Next one is the Stockbridge Muncie ban of Band of Mohicans. Uh, the first one is uh, is is rather rote. It's uh, the the um, Massachusetts State House Council has asked us to um, approve new language for Bill H four six two seven, an act relative to the transfer of original documents to the Stockbridge Muncie community of the Mohican Nation from the town of Stockbridge. Have you all had a chance to review that? Mm -hmm. I'm fine with it. And is there any public comment on the document transfer only? All right, hearing none, uh, may I have a motion to uh, approve the language suggested by House Counsel? I'll make the motion to approve the language. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Well, next thing, um, we had a request letter. Uh, Bonnie was not able to make it. I'm just going to quickly read this into the record. I am not going to attempt uh, her greeting, which I believe means hello. Um, I'm writing in regard to the town's consideration of returning the Indian Borough ground parcel of land in Stockbridge to the tribe, shown on the map attached. Our program has the official and sacred responsibility for our nation to preserve our ancestral burial grounds and other cultural sites such as these in our Mohican homelands. I am offering additional information for your reference attached as the text of the 1809 land agreement by five additional, I'm sorry, by five Stockbridge Muncie Sachems, Sachems? Um, Wherein, the state, wherein they state that this remaining area of our land in Stockbridge has not been relinquished and which they asked resident Dr. Oliver Partridge to assist in preventing the soil from being removed that the bones of our ancestors may lie there undisturbed. 
This agreement was made under pressure of a planned road project and as a last resort to advocate for the gravesite protection while our nation was being forced to move further west. If the concept is supported by the town select board meeting, historic preservation requests that the town send an official letter to the Stockbridge Mun Muncie Tribal Council informing them to the town's interest to return the Stockbridge Indian burial ground back to the tribe for their consideration as our tribal government. Uh, and then the uh, contact information is there. I had a chance today to speak with uh, Monique, uh, who, is a, who is a representative of uh, Runs Cultural Affairs, Monique Tindall. And, and uh, uh, they want to ensure that while the symbol is important to them, the most important thing to them is that there's a plan to maintain and preserve and protect the burial ground. It's, it's more important than any other issue to them. So I would like to make a motion that we empower town council and working with Michael Canales to work with the tribal council to uh, figure out if there's a way uh, to uh, bring a motion to, or, uh, I'm sorry, a, a warrant to town meeting. And uh, if there is, then uh, then we can decide what, once we see what it is, uh, whether we're gonna endorse putting it on the, on the warrant. Um, and I, and if, if you want to discuss that, we can discuss it. Uh, but I've made a motion on the floor. No, I have a motion with it. I'm okay. Okay. Does anybody want to speak for or against a uh, motion to work with the tribal council on uh, the question of the uh, Stockbridge Indian Borough Grant? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's great. Thanks. Um, the next item is, let's see, um, harvesting. Uh, the for third thing on the list first, uh, Michael, we're, we're already going to be um, uh, using town employees for harvesting in August and September, right? Yep. And Michael Nathan has requested that we um, leave the harvester on the water until the end of September. We don't have an issue with that, or is there anything we need to talk about there? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but All I'll right. check with you tomorrow. Um, OK. Uh, there's some question about when the last harvest should be uh, in terms of uh, stunting lily pad growth next year, but I'll let you talk to well, them. We can figure that one out. I'm all just right, referring good. to the question. This is the first time I've heard the question of right. keeping it on the water at all. Yeah, he wants, well, okay. just until the end of September rather than the beginning of September. I don't see why there's a okay. problem, but I'll double good. check. And then, you know, doing a little bit of research, um, uh, uh, Vermont, Connecticut, and Michigan all exempt harvesting from their local DEP regulations. And while this is a political matter, it really is one for the town. Um, I wanted to know if, if uh, you would support an effort if SBSC and, uh, and, uh, and our uh, consultants uh, agree that it's worth, worth uh, bringing up, that we would try to get Massachusetts to approach harvesting the same way that our neighbors do and that Michigan does and exempt it from regulation. Uh, I'm not in favor of it. You're not in favor of talking to the state of delegation? No. I think we need the authority to oversee that. I think we can, shouldn't be eliminating a, I mean, that's a lake, it's a natural environment and stuff. And I don't think just weed harvest and everything is great for the lake. I think it's, we got a good system now and I think we need the watchdog over it, in my opinion. Um, and this is the first I've heard of it. Um, and I, I think I'm with Chucky on this one. I think we do need to have a, another overseeing body look over it. Okay. Any comments from the public? Hi, Roxanne. Yes. You want to come up? Yeah, I agree with Jamie and Chuck in terms of the DEP because it's also the NHESP that has a great deal of regulation. Um, however, I would suggest that the conversation should be taken up with Smitty Pignatelli. Excuse me, could you please speak up a little bit? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I think maybe a conversation could be open with Smitty Pignatelli. Um, the state obviously owns the great ponds, but they do not manage them. And um, I did speak once with Smitty about this some time ago. Uh, I think it would be a great idea for them to put forward a bill where towns could opt in if they have a great pond within their town, um, that they could opt in to say, yes, we are going to take over the responsibility of managing this yeah. body of water. 
if the body of water falls within two towns, then two towns can either opt in or not. If there's two towns, they form a joint um, commission. I think that's a great idea, but it's not really on the agenda. And you know, right. but anyway, that was my suggestion. Yeah, no, I think I think that's also a good idea. Um, and uh, and I will defer. I will defer to uh, our need for oversight from the state to my colleagues and uh, and table that. Um, okay. Um, Let's see, second on order meeting. Uh, let's start with the second. We've got a lot of people on the call. Uh, so uh, we want to listen and respond to attendees questions, concerns, and insights. Who wants to start? Joseph Newberg has his hand up. Hi, Joseph. He's muted. Yeah, I think you're muted. Uh, yep, I have to unmute, I'm sorry. All um, right. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, I am, um, I'm president of the Mackinac Heights Association. Um, there are just a few things I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, and the two first two are thank yous. Um, we really, really appreciate up here uh, and are grateful to Hugh Page and the Highway Department. Um, Hugh puts a lot of personal effort um, in and deserves an awful lot of credit for constant and I would say impactful improvements just about everywhere and uh, up in Mackinac Heights in particular. And uh, I'm very glad that the board um, supports and seems to appreciate that. Um, thank you to the board, uh, to the um, Recreation Committee and the Highway Department again for the great upgrades at the town beach and the additional uh, kayak racks. I think you guys uh, have listened and um, I think we all appreciate that a lot. I just call uh, to your attention um, two um, sort of wish list things that are again, safety related, uh, along with my prior comment on the trees. Um, the Mackinac Heights, you know, is a very hill, hillside community of about 50 homes. It was designed as a, a seasonal community. It's now sort of morphed into a four season community. Um, and as a result, the road uh, system is a little bit challenged. The top of the down road uh, which is a very steep road and there's a big curve at the top, uh, gets very badly iced in the winter and is, is just treacherous. It's a one-way road, so it's, that's the exit. And um, I hope that you'll, uh, if you're not aware of that condition, you'll become aware of it and support the highway department in doing what, whatever it takes to make that a safe um, and that's Same a town road, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is a town road. The, Mackinac, the up road, which is Indian Road, Mm -hmm. The crossroad, which is Mackinac Heights Road, and the down road, which is Taconic View Road, are all town roads and have been town roads for over the for the full 42 years I've lived here and long before that. The highway department knows it, the assessors know it, the police department doesn't always know it, which is a little disappointing, I must say, folks. But I'm I'm glad that the selectmen know it, uh, or at least know it now. But anyway, that that would be a request, and I. Uh, I know those roads are up for some maintenance, the up road and the down road anyway, and I hope you'll support whatever it takes to make it safe for us because it's really bad when you start sliding down that hill onto the main road and you can't stop. Anyway, uh, the, the final wish list thing is the town beach. That's another thing. In the old days, we had a community where a lot of little kids around and everybody walked down to the beach and, you know, the road wasn't quite as dangerous as it used to be, although it was dangerous enough. Well, 40 years later, we have a lot of young families, a lot of kids who move back into the community and uh, people are trekking to the beach. But right now, the only really safe way to trek to the beach is to drive there, even though we're a short hop uh, from the beach. And I'm just hopeful that somebody, and I don't know who it would be, but on the town side would take an interest in improving a pathway from the bottom of Indian Road to the beach. That, you know, there's a big blind curve right at the bottom of Indian Road. So the, the main road takes this blind curve. People may or may not slow down at that blind curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, you couldn't put a crosswalk there. You'd have to put it way, to, you know, down a ways maybe even a little beyond the town beach. So anyway, I, I, th th that's one thing, making a path there and a crosswalk a safe distance from the blind curve. Another way, it's a far out way, but there are some paper roads, um, which nobody owns apparently, up in the woods there that would, would allow a path 
theoretically down to right across from the town beach if anybody had the fortitude and the desire and the, uh, the means to uh, look into that and tackle that. And if, if there is any, then, pardon me, that's it. When we say paper roads? Yeah, paper roads. Oh, yeah, they're, yeah, the they're paper road. The development had a lot of paper roads. And what is a paper road? Paper roads that are there, they were laid out in the original design, but they ended up not being completed. Oh, yeah, I've they, seen those on the maps. Yeah. Roads I never knew what they were. Yeah, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and nobody owned, you know, they're, they're not assessed to anybody. If you look at the assessor's maps. So what you're saying is we're going to cut a new trail and make it a little safer to get to the beach for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's just something that the town could do that we would, you know, have a lot of difficulty ourselves doing. So. Okay, that's a good idea. All right, thank you. Thank you. Jane, what? Jane Carlin. Jane Carlin. Hi, Hi Jane. Thank you. First of all, let me thank you for having a hybrid meeting. It uh, shows all of us how well this can work and it's very much appreciated. Um, I really wanted to thank the town for its ongoing maintenance and upkeep of the town cemetery. It's a place that you really don't ever want to use, but for those of us who have loved ones there, the attention of the town is very much appreciated. I also want to applaud the Parks and Recreation Committee for their follow-up in the additional kayak racks and even in tracking down uh, someone like me whose email got bollocksed. And I just really appreciated the tremendous courtesy that um, volunteers took to do that who serve on that committee. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. I don't see any other hand. Oh, Jay. Dubner? Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, Jay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. My audio is working. Um, I want to thank you also for having the hybrid meeting. I'm uh, at 11 Lakeview uh, in Beechwood. And my neighbors, friends, et cetera, from time to time say that they've heard whispers about second homeowners being charged that extra property tax, which the state allows, which I think they're doing in Cape Cod. And um, I, I would just like to say that if even the thought crosses uh, somebody's mind about doing this, it's really penny wise, pound foolish. Um, as a second homeowner, when we get our property tax bill, we always add money for the low income. Um, and we're always, always donating to Tanglewood, the Berkshire Theater Groups, uh, the Stockbridge Library, Norman Rockwell, the Stockbridge Bowl Association. All of that funding, not just from my family, but from other families they've expressed that would cease to exist because we would now take that money to pay this penalty tax if you want to call it that um so and obviously if those donations cease from second homeowners which i suspect are the majority of the donations to those organizations um they would suffer irreparable harm so i just want to put my two cents in if anybody's even thinking about that what kind of harm it would do to the jewels of stock. I'm thinking about the residential exemption. Oh, okay. Look, uh, Jay, I appreciate your comments. Um, you know, the uh, a couple things. Uh, the average assessed price in stock, which is six hundred thousand dollars, and uh, and I believe that the assessor said last year that were we to do the residential exemption, the impact would be about thirteen percent um, uh, uh, in terms of a raise in taxes, and that worked out to about nine hundred, eight hundred fifty, or nine hundred dollars. Uh, on that six hundred thousand dollars assessed average, um, if we if we evaluate the uh, residential exemption, it will occur at the tax classification hearing, which typically occurs in October. And the the issues before the town that we have to evaluate, and this is my opinion, my colleagues can weigh in, uh, is is one um, ensuring that everyone can afford not to give donations or to do all the great things that you're doing, but to actually pay their taxes and live here. Uh, the way the residential exemption works is it, is, it, is it raises the same amount of money and revenue for the town. So it's not like it's cutting, you know, um, it's not like it's a tax cut that re requires us to cut services. It simply is a shift similar to how many other communities do shifts, whether they're corporate industrial or residential exemption or whatever in the, in, in the state. Um, uh, I think the other consideration that we have to be thinking about is, is in the long term, 
the amount of capital improvements that we have and how we're going to pay for those capital improvements in a way that every single residential taxpayer can afford. And so those are going to be the considerations I take into account when looking at that. And I appreciate um, all the giving that second home owners uh, do. Um, I also recognize that uh, that uh, that perhaps suggesting that you would stop giving over a $900 tax increase is a bit of a false choice. Thank you. You want to comment? No. No. Not right now. I mean, no comment at this point. No. <laughs> Joseph Newberg has his hand back up. Joseph, I, I, I want to, uh, I, I want to just say something about this. You, you know, there seems to be a presumption that every second homeowner is wealthy and owns uh, a substantial property here and can afford whatever you ask them to do a thousand dollars or nine hundred dollars a year forever and that's not true uh, Mackinac heights for example is a community i said of 50 homes on a hillside above the lake very modest mostly cottages a lot many but not most have been fixed up over time um, it was a community and still is of you know school teachers and tanglewood uh, uh folks and uh uh, a lot of young families. This is an entry level uh, second homeowner community. And it is people are usually stretching to buy, usually in the last few years, stretching pretty far to buy up here. And I have no problem saying people in need uh, should have assistance. I have a lot of problems saying if you're a second homeowner, owner, you don't need assistance, you should pay. And if you're a town local resident, um, you should benefit. And that, that just to me is a very divisive, unfortunate distinction. It will create a lot of uh, ill will, but also hardship among the community you're tagging. And I don't think it's worth it. And I don't think in the other communities of which there are only a few in the Commonwealth, as I recall, um, I have had uniform success with doing this. Yeah. It's a cultural thing. And I think you guys should be, and, and women and men and everybody, people should be sensitive to the cultural impact you're having when you want to divide us instead of unite us. I, absolutely nobody is assuming who can afford or who can afford. The state gives us only a handful of choices to ensure that all residents can afford to pay their taxes. You know, my oncologist at BMC told me that in the Berkshire County, which is one of, if not the poorest county in the state of Massachusetts, and Stockbridge, which has a, a median income of $28,000 and a median family income of $48,000. By the way, that includes, that number includes a whole number of retirees uh, who have recently come to Stockbridge and who have bumped that number up. My oncologist tells me that uh, a third of the seniors in Berkshire County choose between food and medicine. This is absolutely not something we would consider because we wanna soak the rich or we think you can afford it or anything else. We have a handful of tools to make sure that at a $600,000 average assessment in this town, that some folks on a fixed income and, a, and on social security can afford to keep their homes. And we're going to evaluate whether that is good policy or not, and it is not about um, penalizing any one community over another community. It's ensuring that as assessments rise and the uneven nature of assessments impact us, that folks can afford to keep their homes and stay in this community as they have their entire lives. Max Cam has his hand up. Yes. Cam. Can't hear you. Are you muted? Is he muted? Uh, he's muted. That's Cam. I'm sorry. That's me. It's a wrong. It's the wrong name. There. This is Peter Ungaro. I live on Hispanic Road. Um, I guess I I want to take a little different tack. As a second homeowner, I'm also um, you know very interested in the conversation around the residential tax exemption, and I followed the discussion last year. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a few points I'd like people to. Or, or at least the, the select board to be considerate of as you go into this discussion in the fall. Um, 
I think the finance committee makes a recommendation because they think clearly and, and uh, importantly about this issue. Last year, they recommended that the RT not be enacted in Stockbridge. Um, I also think that there needs to be a little bit more transparency and discussion around the parameters by which you can enact the RTE. It's a lot of numbers being thrown around, a lot of discussion about percentages, but are you enacting at 10%, at 20, at 30, at 35, the maximum? There needs to be more discussion about how you're going to set that limit, why you're going to set that limit, and what benefits you're trying to enact from the community. And if you don't do that, no one is going to understand your decision and thought process around this issue. Sure. This isn't the tax classification though, Max. Uh, and I think that you're absolutely right. I think that there's a lot of discussion that still needs to happen. This is a conversation that uh, a decision that has to be made in October. And, and, I, and I'm a strong believer in just the sort of discussion that you're talking about. It is a complex formula with a lot of variables as you're pointing out and where there's a sliding scale of impact based on where were we to do this, you know, uh, we, would, we would set it, for example. Um, I, I think that this is perhaps, um, well, I mean, we can have this conversation anytime, including more now and more later during the hearing. I mean, what do you guys think? Well, definitely gonna talk about it more down the road. My point of this is when we first came up is why I voted not to do it in the beginning is until we come up with set numbers, set rate, um, first of all, then I want to know who it benefits, who it doesn't benefit, who it hurts before we move forward and have the actual numbers on our plate before we even bring it to the public in my opinion, um, it's something we can't rush into. Um, so it's, there's gotta be a lot of work done on this yet. Um, it's not a done deal, it's far from a done deal. Um, Cause I wanna know too is if we set this rate this year, next year your valuation goes up, I wanna know how many houses would be fall into the upper rate you know, if they can afford it. So there's, there's a lot to it that we really gotta look into. So it's not something that's gonna be just voted on, you know, just out of a whim. We got a lot of work to do on this. And it will be public hearings on this before we even bring it up to a vote at a, for our vote. Patty, hi. Hi, Patty. Hi, um, so I'd like to actually weigh on this also because I have strong feelings about the residential tax exemption from the moment it started being discussed in this area. Um, some members of the part-time residence group have actually been in touch with other towns in the Commonwealth who have had this enacted to discuss kind of, I think you're underestimating how much acrimony it causes in a community. Because while we can create language around it and make it sound like it's just a supporting other people. It is in fact a penalty for part-time residents. You're saying to people who own certain homes that you're going to pay more mm -hmm. on top of your mill rate simply because your residence is a part-time residence. And I, I really think that the town has underestimated the, the level of acrimony this causes in other communities that have enacted it. And I think it would create, particularly in Stockbridge, an air of ill will because we have such a such a large numbers of part-time residents. So that's my point. And I know this can be discussed at other meetings, at other times, but I just want to put that that like line in the sand for you to understand the level of acrimony that's created in other towns across the Commonwealth that have enacted this. Thanks, Patty. Barbara Cornfield. Barbara. Hi. A um, couple of things. Do you have a number for the average second homeowner valuation? The average assessment in town is $600,000. For second homes? Well, I don't know. Oh, we homes. don't break it out that way. That's what I'm asking. For second homes, what's the average? 
we because everyone's on the same rate right now, we haven't had to break it out. So, but eventually, I guess you would need to know that for your meeting to decide. No. I mean, it, it isn't the tax exemption isn't is the second home or is it just a fairly way so the house? No, it's it, it, the way it, the way it works is that uh, that uh, you take the median assessed value of all homes in Stockbridge, which is around six hundred thousand, I'm told, and then we could. We can set the uh, a residential exemption anywhere from zero, which is that now, to 35% or anywhere in between. Um, it is a one of a handful of exemptions that is allowable under the state of Massachusetts. Uh, so for example, if we set a exemption at 10%, then uh, $60,000 of value would be removed from the assessed value of folks who are here six months in a day and who are, you know, uh, are considered full-time residents. And to pay, make up for that, uh, the tax rate would need to go up a little. In the example I gave of about a 15% increase, that would be at the full 35% of assessed value. Okay. Um, second question is your October meeting to discuss this. Will that be online? And they will, all are. And will you notify us somehow? Everything is posted on the town website. Okay. And you're looking for the tax classification hearing. That's the name of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do have another question on a different topic. Mm -hmm. the, um, the lovely intersection in the middle of Stockbridge. Could you give us a little history on why it has evolved into the way it is? Um, whether there was ever consideration of a roundabout and whether there was ever any consideration of a, a four-way stop instead of a three. Chuck, you want to take that one? Yeah, um, <laughs> got to this point, um, we did intensive studies. We had multiple agencies involved. Um, a roundabout does not fit. Um, it is not enough land. Um, I was in favor of the roundabout till we started laying it out and it just does not fit. Um, this, what we have now is uh, what we agreed upon a select board a while ago. Those painted lines we have there were a trial run for the project that we're, we're going to pursue and have some meetings over the uh, 11th of August for us. did speak to Van, so you will be coming on yep. the 25th. 25th. Setting up public. And then we're going to set up some public hearings. The painted lines you see there in the center would be a raised bump. And those lines you see coming out of the islands would be curbing and the islands would be made bigger. And that intense would shrink the intersection down, which is the biggest issue. The intersection is way too wide. And um, so we decided a year or so ago to paint the lines to give it a test run, uh, but people drive over paint. And um, so we're gonna have, in August, we're gonna have public hearings on it. And uh, just keep an eye on it. Zooms, every meeting is on Zoom. Um, and we'll have the answers and why we're there and what we're planning to do <coughs> so we can put it to town vote at a meeting. Um, would part of that discussion be another stop sign? Uh, we're discussing the what we have designed. We're not making changes and all that. It's When we have these meetings, it'll be on the... Uh, design that we approved. And can you tell us if there have been many accidents at that intersection over the years? No, there has not. It decreased since we- It's not considered a dangerous, dangerous we, intersection. It's not considered state. dangerous by the state. Right. You might want to mention that we have the illustrations of the plan in the selectmen's meeting room. So if anyone wants to come in who's zooming in and those of you that are here after the mm -hmm. meeting, you can take a look at how it can look. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Yeah, and we're going to have the, the open meetings where right. it will really be explained to you and how we got to that point and why we're pursuing this particular design. And specifically on the stop sign, you know, uh, the, the, it's a state route and, uh, and adding a fourth stop sign has a tremendous impact on traffic flow, uh, which is this, this, these, these issues have been debated in this town for a long, long time. And even tried. 
Uh, Gene Gaffey. Gene Gaffey. Uh, this is actually Dick Jaffe. Hi, Dick. Uh, I, I, I've got a couple questions. Oh, Jaffe, couple, sorry. I've got a couple questions and a couple comments about the residential uh, tax exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first question I have is, would it be an automatic exemption for each and every resident? Yes. Full-time resident of the town of Stockbridge? Yes. Okay. Well, my understanding is that the yeah, um, exemption. My understanding is that is that the rationale, as you've explained it, is to help those that are less fortunate but live in the community. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I wonder why the tax exemption would be automatic for all residents. Why shouldn't the uh, more affluent members of the community, you know, share? Uh, in this assistance, you know, to the less fortunate. Uh, uh, Patty and, and a couple other people made mention of the increasing, uh, well, to be polite, dissatisfaction that many of us have as to the way second homeowners are being treated. There are numerous examples of how we are being discriminated, and I'm using that word intentionally. Give me some. Okay. Um, well, for example, and it's not all Stockbridge's fault. I mean, some of it is, uh, you know, part of the wall of the Commonwealth. We can't, uh, we, we are limited uh, as to what committees we can serve on and what positions we can hold. We are, not, right. able to, we are not able to, uh, you know, to run for office and to have the, uh, the same voice in how the community is run, you know, as, uh, you, know, as, as you folks do. Um, you know, we, uh, we don't uh, place a burden on the school system in the community. Uh, many of us don't pay, place a, uh, a burden on many other aspects of the community, but it just seems that if you folks, you know, sincerely want to be fair about this, then you want to pay your fair share also. And if, uh, and, and if you are in a, uh, in a position that you can afford to help the less affluent, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the less privileged as you are asking us to do, then you should be willing to take that same responsibility. And that's why I'm specifically asking you why, how in the world you can possibly justify an automatic exemption for every single person by sheer virtue of the fact, you know, that you're blessed to live in this community full time. Uh, okay, a couple of things first. Um, any second homeowner who wants to sit on an appointed committee can do so. Uh, there, we already have some second homeowners on appointed committees. I spent a lot of time this summer visiting many of the second homeowner communities, and in fact, encouraging folks to do so. The majority of homes in this town are now owned by second homeowners. I think that you having a voice, uncomfortable as this voice sometimes is in this moment, for example, is really important. Your voice is important to us, even when it's critical as it is right now. I will point out that we don't make the laws for the state of Massachusetts as much as I wish we could. Um, uh, we are we simply get one vote and we're 2000 voters out of what, eight, 10 million uh, folks in Massachusetts. So I can't help you with your ability to vote here or to run for office here. What we can do is uh, allow for Zoom participation, for example, and a lot of us have advocated for that for, uh, for, for a fair amount of time because it exactly empowers folks who are not here all the time to participate in these meetings. That's been important to a lot of the folks who vote here and who live here uh, because we think that your voices are important. I will also point out that, um, that uh, when it comes to placing a burden on the schools, I don't have any kids and I'm a full-throated supporter of education. I think it's an intergenerational responsibility we have to each other. And, and, I, and I understand and respect if folks feel like that they shouldn't have to support the schools, I vehem vehemently disagree with it, um, just, to, just to point that out. Finally, in terms of the residential exemption itself, if we had more options, we could look at more options. The fact is that when it comes to tax shifts, there's a commercial industrial personal property exemption, there's the residential exemption, there's only a handful of exemptions we can look at. Now, later in the meeting, we're going to actually have a discussion around a, uh, a, a community preservation gift fund for exactly the reason that you talk about. If folks were to get an exemption and didn't feel like they deserved it, 
they can donate if they like. I'm personally focused, I will tell you this, I'm, I'm personally focused on the folks most in need in this community, not on a question of fairness. I think you make a legitimate point that this can be argued as unfair. I, 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 my personal opinion is that the question of folks actually living in poverty, trying to pay their taxes in a town which has seen a tremendous rise in assessments over the last five years through no fault of their own, have lived here their entire lives. I personally think that those folks deserve a voice too. And I know that comes on the back of you guys and I apologize for that. We don't have any other options. If that were, if this were to go through, which it hasn't yet. Um, and that's my answer to kind of what your concerns are. You guys, to, hold on. To, cl okay. to clarify, if I, if I may, um, I did very specifically say that in regards to uh, running for office, et cetera, that I specifically recognize that, uh, that that comes from, uh, from the state house, you know, that that's not a, uh, I, I did not put that on, on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in regards to uh, the school, and I just want to very specifically point out that I've always personally, as my wife has, we've always supported school bonds and we're strong believers in supporting mm -hmm. our schools, even though we are at that stage in life where we no longer have children in school. But the, uh, the one thing that I would specifically like to hear each one of you address is the main point of what I was trying to say. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it again in a different way. Uh, one by one, would each one of you uh, support or would you not support, you know, some type of an income, you know, test added? You know, There's no legal way to do that, Dick. There isn't a legal way to add an income test to the residential exemption. The state of Massachusetts does not allow it. So, sorry, but this is a complex question and that is not the subject of this hearing. Um, I think we should move on and we'll, we'll have a tax classification hearing. To Chuck's point, we're planning on an informational session ahead of time. This is not a done deal, but I think this is one that we're going to have to like look at over the next few months as to whether or not this makes sense for Stockbridge. Just alone, last year alone, Dick, assessments went from $525,000 to $600,000. The mill rate, you know, to, to use Patty's term, is nine, what, nine thirty-eight a thousand? Okay. You know, just just that seventy five thousand is a, is is an average on that mill rate of like seven hundred fifty dollars in extra money on um, people on fixed incomes. It is impactful, and I know that's hard to hear because in today's world, I I, I hope that you're not assuming that this is just a stick it to the second homeowner's idea. And I and if you are, I apologize and I'm sorry that you feel that way. It's really not about that, you know. Roxanne, I think. Possibly you could clarify that this, the tax exemption as it works, does have a ceiling in terms of the assessed value of property. So let's say if I'm a full-time resident and I own, I think the cutoff was something like 1.2 million. 1.6 million. It's called the break-even rate. But there's the break-even rate. So it doesn't automatically apply to every uh, long-term citizen. But I want to mention that I, I, I share that same concern about the divisiveness of the tax exemption. Mm -hmm. Jay. Patrick, uh, <clears throat> Jay Bykovsky from Larawa Crossroad. Do you want to just um, well, Just hands. very briefly, <laughs> I think it might be appropriate before we get further involved in this subject to have a public hearing where we can have a uh, give and take by all parties relative to this situation. You know, this is an extremely complex matter and it's not something that can be uh, dealt with uh, superficially. Right. And so, we need numbers, concrete numbers. Concrete. So when we talk about it, we're talking fact, not like substance. We right. need concrete numbers. Who's gonna affect, who's gonna hurt, who's gonna help. There's a lot to it and it's not gonna sound to be decided overnight. Um, it, we decided the tax classification here in Chuck, like it is every year. Yeah, this but, is a vote every year at the tax classification. Well, I'm not voting for it until we have all this I'm information. I'm not suggesting you are, and I'm not suggesting <laughs> I am. We're not there yet. Okay. You know, it came yeah. up last year, like, let's do it, and no. I, I also sent you, you, I sent everyone a evaluation of the specific parcel by parcel list based on, on, on Mike Blaze numbers last year, what, three or four months ago. So I'm ready to have the hearing anytime you guys want. Okay. 
Jane Carlin. Hi, Jane. Hi. One of the things I would find very helpful in evaluating the proposal, because I certainly see the pros and cons on each side, would be for um, the time of the public hearing to really have some clear sense of the impact of, um, of the new bill, so to speak. That's probably not the right term. But, but if I'm going to be paying more to do the social engineering that you're talking about, <laughs> I really want to understand and feel that what I'm doing is having a real impact and you know and to get beyond the social engineering conversation into the dollars and cents and what kind of relief the a new tax rate would provide i would find that very helpful at the time of an open sure. year thank you uh, dbh guru mm -hmm. hello hi <laughs> oh, this is Bob. Hi, Bob Leverett. Boy, this meeting has gone late. You know what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to continue the Iceland. Well, um, the only thing is we want to talk a little bit about the uh... Bob. If, if you um, if you want, you can step off, and uh, I think we can cover it. I apologize. This has gone way longer than I thought. Bob is uh, the guy who was on the cover of Smithsonian Magazine and was here to help us figure out the Iceland trees. But since we're in the middle of this this uh, first part of the agenda that has gone a little longer than we thought. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I, I made it late. Uh, I was uh, uh, trying it's to okay. get home. We haven't even gotten to it yet. So if you can hold on for a bit, you can, you're welcome to stay, but I think we're at yeah, least I, 15 I, minutes away. Sure, I can All hold right. on. Thanks. Uh, and Hi, Hi, Patty. Hi, so um, Ruth, um, Patrick, I, I think earlier you mentioned that it's the only option for accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. The only shift, I said. Okay, so um, I thought that the resident, I'm so, and I don't know the exact name of it, the senior tax deferral program was also an option. So mm -hmm. why is the town taking that as a first pass approach? The town hasn't done anything, Patty. We're looking at all, any and all options. And and we have already, I think, put in place uh, a senior exemption. Was we it already 500? have seniors. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Next, anyone else? Is there another one? Are there two? Bob has his hand up. I'm not sure if it's for this or. Oh, no, that's okay. No, it's not for this. He's not oh, from here. All right. I don't see any other hands up. All right. Uh, uh, thank you. We had a good candid discussion of what some more issues are. Anybody else say anything at all on this one? Thanks. All right. Next thing. Um, the rest of the meeting is actually really interesting. Please stay. You'll get a taste of what, um, you know, what now that we're doing Zoom gives you the ability to uh, participate in. Um, I, I would just want to make one last point um, on voting. We have two elections a year generally. We have a town meeting and then we have the annual election for you know offices. Most decisions in this town are made at hearings just like this. Like Chuck is saying, you know, we'll have a hearing, we'll decide to vote on it. We'll decide those decisions are made at the committee level. Okay. We get recommendations, we take votes. This happens all the time. These are public meetings that are open to everyone. And I and I I am I'm sensitive to the fact, though we can't do anything about it, that many of you can't vote. But voting only happens a couple times a year and decisions are made in this room by many, many committees uh, before the town all year long. So feel free to engage, you know, um, clearly, you know, your opinions have had an impact today. And, uh, and if you keep stay engaged, you'll continue to have an impact, you know, going forward. Um, anyway, thank you. All right, next on our agenda is Town Kane. <laughs> Georgia, you want to come up? This is Georgia Marsden, former town administrator. So, so uh, and I, and, and Mr. What is it, Fredsley? Fredley. Fredley. Do you want to come up too? I know that your family had a part in the creation of the cane. Um, maybe you could start by giving us a little bit of history of the cane and, and, uh, and then Georgia, you had some ideas on what to do next.
Hi. Me? Yeah, you got both of you. Don't forget. I got that on my. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm the great grandson of the manufacturer of the cane, Boston Post cane. And uh, I knew uh, virtually nothing about the cane um, when I grew up. Uh, it was only perhaps 20 years ago that. Explain what the cane is. Uh, the Boston Post cane um, was um, awarded. It was, the Boston Post cane was initiated by the Boston Post uh, out of Boston, Massachusetts um, back in 1909. And the intent was to uh, award the cane to the oldest resident in town. And uh, it was a tradition that went on for many years, and I believe for many years afterwards, it was became a lot of people became uh, disinterested in it. And uh, I've talked to many people about the Boston Post cane in the past, and um, many people have had absolutely no idea what it was all about. But in 1909, uh, they uh, had manufactured uh, 700 canes to be distributed throughout. Um, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. Uh, Connecticut and Vermont were excluded. And uh, those canes were to be distributed to towns, but not to cities. And so these, these canes were awarded to the different towns, including Stockbridge, uh, and I assume to many of the other towns here in Berkshire County. Uh, if you go online and do some research, you'll find other towns that have been uh, given the cane to be awarded to the oldest resident. And Georgia, you have some ideas on 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 arcane displaying it in town hall. I do, but is Steve finished with the history? No, no, said yeah, no. I mean, that, I mean, I, I I understand it. Uh, we still have a lot of things. Uh, okay, yeah. so okay, sure. um, I feel very strongly <clears throat> that the town, the Boston Post cane that was given to the board of selectmen, should remain at the town offices in Stockbridge. And um, it was always my goal to put it in a shadow box on display with um, the names of all the recipients underneath it as the years go on. Now, there's many years that you don't have anyone getting the Boston Post cane because someone could be the oldest resident at that particular year and carry on for 20 or 30 years longer. So, um, <laughs> so there's not, I mean, it's not every single year does this happen. Um, so I, I think it's very important that it remains in the town. So I was going to suggest that, that Georgia and Michael work together to implement the vision that she started with your late husband, as I understand it, to, uh, to create the shadow box and kind of finish that vision uh, by, uh, by creating uh, a little display here in town hall. And right. I just wanted to get you guys input on that. Where is it? I'm sorry. It, it's here. Uh, for, many, <laughs> for many years, it was not here. Um, <laughs> And um, but it was given back to us by a family member, and um, but we continued on with the whole awarding to the eldest female and male by giving them a certificate and having them come to a selectman's meeting and honoring them. But I can't say what's happened since I've been gone, which would be six years on Monday. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never had it here. It never happened in one of my meetings. Right. So it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. So is it, do you guys have uh, any problem with Georgia and Michael working on um, figuring out a way to uh, execute this vision in town hall? I think it sounds lovely. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> oh, I can tell you the last person that uh, was awarded it was Clem Kalisher, who just passed away. Oh, wow. um, and then um, the female was Virginia Freienberger, which I'm saying wrong, but. <laughs> I would love to. I would so love to do is that. It a, is it an honor to get the cane or a curse? <laughs> <laughs> it's a curse. The future is not bright. <laughs> so I make a motion that we uh, we uh, uh, empower uh, Georgia and Steve and Mike to work together on uh, figuring out a permanent home for the cane in Town Hall. I'm not second it. Yeah. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You decide awesome. where it goes. Yeah, you could just decide. Yeah, I kind of already have an idea. Have <laughs> but, but, uh, just Bob, we're, we're going to get to you in about one minute. Um, just real quick, uh, you know, we have this new scholarship fund potentially. Um, it's a, only an option on the tax bills. It's not required. Um, and uh, and I wanted to just, uh, Georgia now currently is part of a committee that manages the, the town scholarships working in conjunction with the school district. 
Um, and to the degree that this generates some funding, uh, you know, uh, I, I thought it might make sense to allow Georgia, Peter Dillon, and, and Mike to uh, figure out how to implement any awards from this, uh, from, uh, from any receipts that come from the new optional uh, uh, checkoff in terms of scholarships that's going to be on the tax bills. So I, may I just say yeah, a couple of things? I, I know that, that you're late on this, but um, right now uh, we award seven scholarships. And out of the seven scholarships, um, four of them were actual Stockbridge scholarships that were managed by the, our treasurer. And then as years went by, we invested them with Berkshire Taconic Foundation. Um, out of the seven scholarships, um, six of them, well, five of them can be awarded to Stockbridge students only. Well, four of them. One is for Stockbridge and West Stockbridge. And another one, which is a private scholarship, can go to Stockbridge or West Stockbridge students. So, um, and on our committee, we have nine members, seven of which um, live in Stockbridge or formerly lived in Stockbridge. Plus we have two staff members from Berkshire Hills. So um, I'm willing to work with Michael and Peter Dillon to, um, Thank you. to work on the scholarship. And, and the idea is to sort of, yeah, they've got to get any money first. If you get any money, right. <laughs> Good. Um, anybody have any comments, questions, anybody out there? Okay, so I'd like to make a motion that we um, we align the uh, scholarship distribution plan for the new scholarships with the existing um, plan to manage, evaluate, and uh, distribute scholarships that we already have for existing ones. Well, I have a question on that because I believe the act says it has to remain with the, the treasurer, so we would have to work with the treasurer would have to be involved also. Let us bring up. I'll work with Georgia yeah. and Peter, and we'll bring a recommendation back to this. Right. It's even better. Mostly. That would be better. Right. We could work on that together. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Nice to have you back. All right. Thank you. you nice sitting back up here. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Once in a while, I don't mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, I see Bob Leverett. And is Ken on the call now? Ken Gooch? I'm here. Oh, hi, Ken. How are you? All right. These are our experts for Ice Glen. So, Ken, maybe you could start off. We just wanted to have a quick status update on sort of the, the what's going on with the ash trees and the hemlock trees and uh, sort of the good and the bad and, you know, um, what some potential next steps are. Uh, you're muted, though. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So um, the ash trees were injected last year with MMEC from benzoate for uh, control of emerald ash borer. Um, I was in there monitoring for the hemlock adelgid treatments and all the ash looked good except two of them came down in the winter time from storm damage. I, just because of the pressure of emerald ash borer in the area and all over Berkshire County and to the west in New York State, I would recommend that those trees get treated again next year so that you're on a two year cycle at least. Uh, I think after that, you're probably okay. You could go to a three year cycle because the pressure wouldn't be as high with um, the amount of emerald ash borer around. But the trees are healthy. And if you are in that area and you look around, you'll see there's a lot of dead ash trees outside of Ice Glen. Probably most of that is due to uh, emerald ash borer. And uh, and Michael, we have the uh, we have the the appropriation in place to treat those next year, right? Yes. And uh, and do you feel like we need a motion to approve that? No, not okay. at this point. Okay, great. And uh, and how did the how much treatment go this summer? Um, so it well, just to be honest, you didn't get a lot of trees done. You, I think it's around 45, 46 trees that got injected. They kind of started late. The system they were using was very, very slow. Um, mm -hmm. So out of the 350 trees surveyed, like you, again, you only got like 45, 46 trees injected. And have, have, have you been back since the injection? Yes. Yeah, I've been back. And when would, uh, when would it be evident whether the injection is working? 
you would not see any kind of results until next year. Okay. Yeah. So, so out of question, you know, is, 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 is it, was the, when we talk about the method of slow intake, is there a faster method to inject the trees that should be part of the RFP? Um, is it just that some trees are taken it very slowly? Well, it's a mixture of both and that, that they, um, that it was starting to get warm. So the trees pretty much shut down when it gets warm. The system they were using is just a much slower system. There are faster systems to get it into the tree. Okay, but let's focus on that. For most yeah. faster systems, can the RFP require, if, can future RFPs require this faster system? If yeah. you write up the spec that way, you, yeah. yes. Yep. Um, and, and, and now my other question is, are there trees, especially away from where there may be homeowners, but wherever where you believe that uh, basal bark spraying would immediately serve to save more of the trees than will otherwise be saved? I would, yes, I would definitely recommend that you do some basal bark spray, at least the amount up to the acreage. Like you can only use a certain amount of uh, material, pesticide material, mm -hmm. if there's an acreage, um, you can only use a certain amount of dinutefron, which is the pesticide per acre. And I would definitely use that method in uh, in in part of the parcel just because it's quicker and, and the little um, it's not faster acting, but it's quicker and you get a lot more trees done and get more more trees done okay. versus injecting. So when is the next injection cycle? Is it this fall or next spring? You you could start um, sub, beginning of September when things start to cool down. Okay. You, you could go right up to November. Okay. So listen, when we met a year and a half ago. What struck me at the time was <coughs> that you and Bob, who's taken the time to be with us today, and uh, and uh, Mike Morey suggested that many of the many, if not most, of these trees would die in the next three to five years if we didn't treat them. And I think that we just need to recommit. I guess we've got had two town meetings now where overwhelmingly the these appropriations have passed. That that tells me that this is that saving these trees is a significant priority of the town. And I just want to emphasize that if we can start injecting with the faster method, you know, come September that, you know, perhaps you guys could get this RP if it's a 30 day, what is the window of the RP? 30 days? It, it minimum would be, yeah. 30 days. So 30 to 45 days. So we're looking at, you know, it's July 28th. Let's, let's like get this out in the next few days so that we, if there is a window where we can be injecting some with the faster method, we're able to do that and or with the existing vendor, I don't really, we don't need to micromanage it. I'm just, you know, I'm just encouraging um, swift response. And I think that on the question of whether or not um, to, to use some basal bark to complement this, this process, I, I, I think we should defer to, um, to the Agriculture and Forestry Commission on that. I will point out that I don't believe they have another meeting till the end of August. And so I'll, I'll you know, I mean, I don't have an opinion on this one. Do you think we should just authorize that? Do you think we should talk about it more? What do you guys recommend that we do in terms of looking at the, the, the bark spraying? Are you looking for my opinion? I'm looking for anyone to talk <laughs> I, I would definitely recommend that you do basal bark spray as an addition to the stem injection. And does the does the RFP support that currently or no? We would have, we could go out with a separate for the basal bark spray, right. and then we could continue with the current ones just with starting back up injections, or right. we could rebid right. all of it. Okay, so um. As anybody, what do you guys think of that plan? I mean, you know, we're we're well, the experts are saying yes. I would keep the injection part going and bid the other part so we don't things don't get lost and we don't end up in nothing. Right. Okay, we can continue that. I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah. It's just that sound good or Bob, you want to add anything? Any comments? Well, I, I totally support Ken and, and his expertise. I've known him a long time to have total faith in him. So whatever he would recommend would be what I would advocate for. 
okay. I'm just thinking that you need to get you need to get to these trees as many as possible right away because many of them, if you don't get some pesticide into them very quickly, you're going to lose a lot of them. They, they are so, on the edge. So my point is, if you keep going with the injections you're doing now, keep that on the table, and then go out for yeah. bed with the other one. In case that gets hung up and be, it's later, we're still doing something in September. Right. We're not waiting. We got the slow injection we do in September with the current award. We got a new RP for the fast injection that maybe we complement it. And we need the basal bark uh, to complement it if we're going to save as many as possible. I think that that sounds like what the plan should be, right? Yep. That'll make a motion we follow that. Yeah. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can you excuse myself for a second? Yep. Can you do the Everford Bridge one? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Next, second Everford Bridge design. First one came out really nice. Yeah, the first uh, Everford Bridge is done. Um, completed. Uh, we're going to, I'm setting up a meeting with Foresight and uh, QPage, our highway superintendent. I'll be reaching out tomorrow to do the punch list items, but substantial completion is done. There's just a few minor. Mm -hmm. things that will be taken care of, cleaned up, and then the entire project will be closed out. Uh, we did receive, as when we put together the proposal for the borrowings and money at last year's town meeting, we mentioned that we would, two things we would go after is securing first a Chapter 85 design for the second Evergrove Bridge. Well, we had an estimate on the cost and just the feasibility. We didn't have full design. We did receive that grant. So we are going to proceed ahead with the Chapter 85 design of the second Evergrove Bridge with anticipation that we would apply for up to a half a million dollars of for the building of the second Avic Road Bridge next spring. So uh, things are moving along very well on that. Um, something that just came up the other day, um, just to let you know, nothing we need to act on, is that the original, the core sampling of the Tuckerman Bridge did show that the foundations are solid. Good. So that means that the original estimate that we were looking at at about 1.7 to 300,000 of design is is should be accurate because uh, one of the fears was if you had to get in the foundation the cost of the bridge would have really oh, well. shot up so good news there good. so that's the update so now the completion of the first bridge is not allowed i haven't been there so long it's not allowed to get to the parking it will allow people to get to the park and park, park at the park mm -hmm. oh, so the second bridge <laughs> if everything goes within two years the second bridge will be completed also okay and will it match the yes. first one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just put a different one up. Huh? Yeah, we'll, uh, it'll we'll actually be tied it. in. Okay. We'll look at where the guardrail is mm -hmm. along that one bank. Mm -hmm. There's a current, the, the collision one, that big head, mm -hmm. will be brought okay. into the other one, so it'll all be built Smooth. together. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Any questions for anybody about that? Anybody out there? I don't see any hands okay. up on that. Affordable Housing Trust Fund. That's you. You've been sitting a long time. So kind of explain what it is and uh, where we're at. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Jay Bykofsky. Uh, I am the chair of the Stockbridge Finance Committee, as well as the uh, chair of the current Affordable Housing Trust Fund Committee, which was formed initially on an interim basis. And this committee has to date completed its objective, and I'm, I'll go through that with you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the select board for giving us the opportunity to share with you all the idea of establishing on an ongoing basis, a permanent affordable housing trust committee. Now, back to 10, uh, actually Patrick White's uh, allotted me up to two hours but I could get this done. <laughs> I can get this done substantially less. Okay, um, the Affordable Housing Trust, the initial committee, had its we discussion took place in October of 2020, and the interim committee has been operating for one year and has had five meetings, and basically it has completed its objective. Uh, which is exploring the development and conversion of market rate rental properties to afford affordable housing for the elderly 
and moderate and low income households, as well as considering down payment grant assistance to first time uh, qualified home buyers. Now, the objective of the initial committee was to develop basically uh, a declaration, okay? In other words, a statement of purpose to ultimately be implemented by a permanent committee. And um, we wanna take this opportunity to thank the members of the interim committee for their dedication, interest, and participation on behalf of our town. And FYI, everybody, uh, towns like Lenox, Lee, and Great Barrington have uh, uh, a uh, affordable housing trust committee. So this is something that's in, been in effect. And additionally, uh, at prior town meetings, 225,000 has been uh, approved by CPC in the town to be used for this purpose. Now, basically in summary, the establishment of a permanent housing trust, affordable housing trust committee has also been reviewed by town council. So all the details are there. The details of the declaration have been posted online under the committee minutes as well as circulated to members of the select board. And basically in a nutshell, the declaration proposes a seven person committee, uh, a seven person board of trustees uh, with staggered terms. Two people for one year, two people for two years, and three members for three years. And uh, at least five must be permanent town residents. So that, uh, based on a prior conversation, gives the opportunity for second homeowners to participate in this effort. Highlight to the declaration, what are, what are the powers of the trustees? Firstly, to accept and receive property uh, with funding allowed by Mass General Law 443 exclusively for uh, community, uh, community housing. Secondly, purchase and retain real and personal property. Next, execute and deliver deeds and assignments. And these, this is not limited to this committee. Uh, third, employ advisors, agents, accountants, appraisers, and lawyers as deemed necessary. Uh, next, to borrow money is deemed advisable for mortgages and pledge assets uh, as collateral. To sell and lease exchange properties at public auction or by private contract and to manage or improve properties as well as abandoning interest in those not considered worth retaining. The trust shall conduct an annual audit. It'll be audited just like the town is audited. And also meetings of the trust shall be held at least quarterly. So again, um, this information has been reviewed uh, and, and uh, approved by town council as well as the prior uh, housing trust committee and uh, proposed to this select board for approval to move forward in appointing a permanent committee. And that's it. It ain't two hours, but we look forward to any questions. Uh, have any, questions any comments? On, on the document here? Yes. Oh, Ken, you want to come up just so we can hear you? This is uh, 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 Ken Frenzo. Where do you get your finances from, and would it include uh, federal, would it include federal monies? And are there any? It's typically state. It's state. It's okay. state sponsored money, okay. and basically the town has to meet minimum uh, affordable housing criteria to be eligible for this. That's ten percent. This town exceeds that. Ken, Ken, there's two issues here. One is that um. We have to have a certain amount of affordable units, which we already reached that threshold. We have that. Where does that come from? Is that federal or state? Well, no, no the threshold. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, everyone stop. The uh, what we're talking about now is units. So at Heaton Court and at Pine Woods, we have a total of about eighty-five units. Right. Because there's less than eight hundred and fifty full-time residential homes in Stockbridge, we meet the ten percent threshold. That this isn't that. This has to do with building more units so that people of uh, either uh, up to like 110% of median family income, folks could possibly get a down payment assistance, or we could expand Pine Woods, or we expand Heaton Court, um, or we could build conceivably other things, but you know, with Habitat for Humanity or whatever. That typically right now is funded through 
our community preservation uh, act right. requires again we get basically a matching grant. We get three. We take three percent of your tax money, and the state matches it, and that goes into a pool that has to be spent on either open space or housing or historic preservation. Those are the only three categories. You have to spend at least ten percent of that four hundred five hundred thousand dollars a year on each one of those categories. So we've taken some money over the last two years and we've put it into the affordable housing trust fund as is mandated by the state in terms of that program. So, so far we funded it at 100,000 the first year and 125,000 last year. And that will give us a pool of money that we could then use for down payment assistance for qualified individuals who meet the, the, the maximum income. This is one where we can put an income restriction on it. Um, it's where we could uh, fund repairs at Pine Woods or at Heaton Core. It's where we could use the money of expansion, expansion also plan, though we this 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 board uh, funded a housing production plan independently of this money. We did it with ARPA money. So that's basically how this works, you know, in a nutshell. Okay. Any, anything else? Who's on the committee? I'm sorry? Who's on this committee? Well, okay. No, who's the, on that committee? Which, the original committee? The original committee. Who, who the original that? committee uh, was myself, Nancy, Nancy Sosha, was Tom Shop, was Mock Mills, and with representation, Patrick White. And okay. they, we also had a- Interested in being on this committee or? And myself. Yeah. Well, we opened it up to everyone and yeah, we've gotten- Are they interested right. in being on it? Who, what's that? Are these people interested in continuing? Uh, there are, the, the request has been made and names submitted to the select board. I don't have those names. Okay. okay. And that's something that ultimately the select board needs to, to review and decide who should be on the permanent committee. And that brings up, you know, we have had some people who have sent in Good. recommendations. Yeah. It says this is an independent, you know, quasi-independent, if you will, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's like a board of directors of a trust. Um, uh, you know, we can provide, you know, uh, you're welcome to reach out to them, that's all I'm saying. You know, because we are going to have to vote on this. And we do have um, uh, at least as many, perhaps more candidates than we have slots. That's so. unheard of. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so when are we? We're going to put that in the next meeting. Okay. Perfect. So if you guys have... You can work with Michael to get folks' names if you feel like reaching out to them. But this is, we are basically enabling, this This group has got a lot of flexibility in terms of how to spend the town's money. So it's important to get it right. Yep. So, okay. Barbara, and the board determines who gets the housing? The board determines not only who gets it, potentially like a down payment assistance, but they depend, they, but it determines where to prioritize well, yeah, but it you depends. Know, if you add on to heat and core, then it's based on a series of yeah. definitive uh, criteria. Yeah, there's, a lot, of, you know, there's okay. a whole lot of restrictions. The first thing I think this group will do is to figure out how to manage this housing production plan that we've authorized. So that the first year I see is really going to be a year round planning and a working. The housing production plan is a state five year kind of plan that has to be approved by the select board the planning board and the state of Massachusetts. So if this group is managing that, for example, in conjunction with the planning board and the select board, it, it's basically a consensus driven, you know, you have public meetings, you do surveys, you you kind of, you know, balance what the town needs, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and take a look at how to prioritize these sorts of investments. And that'll probably take up most of the energy of this board in the first year. I, I, Patrick, more, more to your point, this is not an arbitrary thing. There are definitive criteria, yeah. how how it, how these things are done, how properties, how down payment is given, what the what the family financial uh, uh, annual sal uh, income is, you know, it's not a, and it's it's audited and monitored. So uh, this isn't, this isn't an arbitrary capricious kind of thing, yeah. you know. Barbara, you had a question? Yes. Um, do you have any Section 8 in the town? We already have Section 8, actually. It's managed by the Stockbridge Housing Authority. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, it, basically, they manage uh, the Stockbridge Housing Authority manages Section 8 regionally, actually, not even just for the town of Stockbridge. Thank you. Because, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? So should we have a vote to accept the, do we already do that? 
No. Okay, no, so uh, I always forget to do the vote. Um, I'll so make uh, vote. I'll make a motion. We accept the uh, report. And I'll second. It's not a report. It's actually the trust fund documents. Trust fund documents. Thank you. We second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank Maybe you. they got something done. I'm yeah. very shocked. Thank you. And, and I, did, it. I did it in less than two hours. And you You're did a nice it. presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote it down. Yeah. I didn't get it wrong. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Finally, uh, uh, I'd like to suggest that we get in the table if you want, uh, that we uh, create a community preservation gift fund, which is a way for folks to donate to the town if they so choose. Um, How is that? Land or cash. How is it done? It's just simply a, a it's sort of like the ice climbing gift fund. It is one that would allow for those three buckets to receive gifts from folks in town. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll, uh, yep. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. Anything is appropriate time for anything in this meeting. <laughs> and this is more for me personally to, to understand where the town stands on abuses of properties from. Can we just vote on this and then get to that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll all, so we had a motion, yes. So this one goes where? What? People donate and it goes away. It goes into community preservation, which would be housing or open space or historic preservation. That money is directed. So we get four or 500,000 a year. And so I want to give the town 100 grand. It could be directed there. Okay. So motion? I second. I made the motion. She seconded. I second it. All those in favor? Aye, Patrick. Well, whatever. You guys are all eyes? All right. That one's done. Um, so, uh, uh, Ken, we're going to just take real quick action on the one day alcohol permits, which will take 30 seconds, I think, uh, unless there were folks want to talk about them. We have for Chesterwood a reception on August 3rd, August 4th, August 10th, August 12th, August 17th, August 18th, August 25th, September 10th, October 8th and a wedding on August 6th. Uh, oh, is that, we're still on Chesterwood here? No, the first. No, Chesterwood no. Was goes first yeah. all the way through October. Okay, right, October 8th, right. Yeah, I'll make, uh, so motion for Chesterwood. I'll make a motion. For before we have a motion though, we have a motion on the floor. Does anyone want to speak for or against the uh, one day alcohol licenses for Chesterwood? Hearing none, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Second my All right. <laughs> All right. Then for Botanical Garden. Uh, I had a question. Uh, botanical or Wheatley? Uh, oh, we've got an uh, uh, August 6th yeah. wedding, an August 7th event, uh, th August 13th wedding, August September 10th wedding. This is an opening on September 16th and a wedding on October 1st. Are there any public comments on the Botanical Garden's weddings or other one day alcohol licenses? Or the hand garden. Hearing none, do we have a motion? Has her hand oh, up, I'm sorry. I'm not, Barbara has her hand up, but I'm not sure if that's. Barbara, do you have a comment on this one? Barbara Cornfield? No, I forgot to take my hand oh, out. That's sorry. Okay. Right, we all do it. We all do it. All right, do I have a motion on the potential garden? <laughs> I'll make oh, a motion. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Justin. Have you seen her Just oh, yes. new? Yes. Oh, what? Justin, make a new? Justin, you. Can you I just knew that. Oh, you're <laughs> having way more fun than we are here at the select board meeting. I make yeah, what's your address? I we can stop motion. by on the way home. I make a motion we prove by Canada. All right, I second it. Oh. All's in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, we're going to go into uh, uh, taking action on the fire Aye. contract. Yeah, more. No. You're not done. You're taking no. No, weekly. Weekly. Oh, we have more. Not done. There's a lot of yeah. parties in this town, I'll tell you. Um, Amy brought up a question on Wheatley. And I support. Say it again. Wheatley have a question. On I have a right. question about Wheatley. Because everyone else follows a pattern that closes at 11. This one says 1130. So mm -hmm. the question is, is it inside or outside? And I believe the reason why they need an entertainment license is the change of time. Is not correct. They have a they have an entertainment license. They're they asking to go beyond the eleven that you got that the select board in the past has held in residential. Right. Right. So they took it eleven. So they we have an entertainment license before us because they have they have they they don't need they need a special permit to exceed what their license allows. Right. So my question is: it is it inside or outside? Uh, I imagine it's both on August twenty seventh. Okay. Ken is a neighbor. 
Uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts on really going to 11.30 for a wedding instead of 11? It doesn't, doesn't. Have they been good? 11.30 They're good. is fine. Okay. I have, no, I have no problem. Well, I, I just no wanted power. to consider it. <laughs> yeah, what's the general feeling? Of the I know, but I wanted to be I just don't want to know. Yes. Yes. I, I just don't want to set a precedent that, you know, we could get a bunch more after this. It's not a precedent. This is a one day license. No, but I, mean, I know. Yeah. We want to be considerate of everything. Okay, you know, the neighbor, neighborhood feeling matters. And in this case, I haven't heard any complaints from the Wheatley Weddings from the folks who literally live right next door, like Kendo's. Mm -hmm. You know? I have no problem with that. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. Right. Yeah. Any any comments from the public? So, do you guys uh, generally want to make a motion, or you want to deny it? Oh, oh, deny it. I just wanted to. Ask. <laughs> well, it's not denying it. It's still the wedding. It would, if you deny it, it can't go past eleven. Correct. Actually, if you're, these are just votes at the meeting. This isn't a hearing. If you decide, <laughs> oh. if you decide to deny or restore, can we can require a hearing, or we can approve it. Can require a hearing. All right. No. Uh, Mm. So all those I'll, in favor I'll make of a motion, motion that we uh, I'm getting tired, sorry. Accept the Wheatleys. Eleven thirty. Jamie? Um, I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. <laughs> one day alcohol license in Holman Rockwell, August twentieth, one to four. Huh? Any concerns out in the public or support no. out in the public? They're far away. No, may I have a motion on the one day alcohol license from one to I'll four. Make a motion. Okay. I'll second it. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Uh, take action on a one day alcohol license for wine and malt only for handcrafted. Uh, Justin, uh, he's, uh, you know, do you want to weigh in or do we just want to approve that one too? This is all outside, uh, correct? Not in the building. Outside? Yep. Yep. Okay. I'll make a motion. We accept it. I second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Before you go, let's just like right talk now. Thank you guys. Oh, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you have the fire chief's contract. We're going to do that though after we uh, we just hear from Ken. Give this question. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted an update on non-resident second home ownership and the abuses of the properties um, for noise or the way they advertise their property as opposed to the way the property is actually mm. uh, abused for us neighbors and what the what the status is on enforcement. He's talking about. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all know. So the town, so we did issue a warning letter and then a follow up letter of notice of non compliance for the advertisement of uh, a property in town. Uh, they have corrected their advertisement. Their advertisements have been correct ever since um, from that second notice that they received. Um, and uh, as far as noise complaints, noise complaints are directed to the police department, and then we would just keep track of those as time go as time goes on. I'm not aware of additional noise complaints that have come in. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that that's where that stands as of as of right now. But we did have one property, and and after warnings, they did comply. Okay. Has it been fine. is it Isn't better? Problematic. Pardon? Is it been any better? Um, yes, it actually has been Good. better. Yeah. So yeah. Thank God. At least and now, from think, from my point of view, two hundred yards good. away. Yes. Good. Yay. What? Ned and the ZBA they're working on the shed and all that stuff. Right? They're yeah, that's, ruled against that, 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 that's Done. a separate issue. Yeah. I'm saying, but it's yeah. I mean, it's Done. everything yeah. in the process. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're you know, if government works. You want a junior mint? It takes forever to get things right. done. Right. You, right. Right. you need to vote for that one. Fire chief in open session. I got it. I, got it. I, know. I know we're doing that. So, do we? Uh, do you have any questions on the fire chief's yes. contract? We had already approved it. Accept it. Yes, he did. Okay. Um. Mm -mm. I don't think Make so. a motion. We accept the fire chief's contract. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> and on that note, any other questions or comments from the public? Aye. Thank you all for coming today, and uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the frank the frank conversations. Please keep showing up. We need participation. Um, and uh, on that, I will make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.